Hi, this is Jeffrey Reddick, creator of Final Destination, and you are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. But remember, the risk of cheating the plan, of disrespecting the design, could incite a fury that could terrorize even the Grim Reaper. And you don't even want to fuck with that Mac Daddy. Tonight's upload is brought to you by our patrons from the Patreon page. That's Cecilia Spears, Hawaii, Carl Eakins, Catherine McClear, Sean Campbell, Iron Alexa, Allison Seib, Ryan Woodward, TikTok12, Bree, and Bonanza Jellybean. Thank you guys so much for supporting the channel through Patreon. And if anybody listening right now enjoys the content of the 80 Slasher Librarian YouTube channel, and would like to help keep it going and growing for a long time to come, then click the link in the description below and sign up on Patreon for as low as 2 to $5 per month. You get some great rewards depending on the tier you select, such as the $2 tier gets you the early access content, the $5 tier gets you the early access plus a free ebook emailed to you every 3 months, and every 12 months you get a free gift from the merch store. There's also a $15 tier that gets you a free gift from the merch store every six months, a free ebook every three months, and you can appear on the podcast and voice a character in an audiobook narration once per month. So there's many choices to choose from. Just click the Patreon link in the description below and check it out. There's even a mega tier that comes with a lot more stuff. And enjoy tonight's upload of Final Destination Dead Reckoning. Final Destination Dead Reckoning. Chapter 11 As she dreamed, darkness, nothingness, and then, this time, the voices in her head were louder. Jess had to put her hands over her ears in order to hear herself think. There were shouts and screams, bellows of rage, and the occasional peal of hysterical laughter echoing through the void. The voices weren't friendly or unfriendly, they just were. But they weren't important. This time, Jess knew what she was looking for. Concentrate. Just beyond the edges of her perception, she heard a different sound, an older one, a noise that harked way back to the very beginnings of man's evolution. Straight away, she knew what it was. It was the sound of death. It didn't have a tone, exactly. It was more a kind of feeling in the air, a sensation of wrongness that you couldn't quite shake as though your skin were suddenly turned inside out on your body, and all your nerves were exposed to the air. It was as soft as silence, and as all-pervading as the night. And when you got right close up to it, it was cold enough to freeze your thoughts, turning them into icy and intricate patterns in your brain. In the grayness of the void, Jess turned her head this way and that, seeking out the source of the feeling, like someone trying to get a signal on a cheap cell phone. Every nerve screamed at her to leave, to run away before it was too late and save herself from the unspeakable horror of what she knew lay before her. But she had to go onwards. She took a step forward, then another. With each step, the pressure of terror inside her head increased, until she felt as though the next step would cause her mind to explode. 
Just when it got unbearable, she stopped. There. Jess opened her eyes and looked down, seeing the familiar rocky pathway beneath her feet. The pathway appeared to be old and freshly hewn, both at once, as though she were seeing the path's entire history in one glance. A sense of deja vu swept through her, and she glanced sharply downwards into the abyss beside her. She knew she'd been here before, but that didn't concern her. This time, there was something different. Jess glanced up and down the path, but it was utterly empty. Smoke swirled overhead, the night pressed in all around her, and it seemed to be growing darker with the passing of each second. Ahead of her, the lights on the hilltop glowed temptingly bright, but she ignored them, concentrating on the job at hand. She knew what she had to do. Closing her eyes, Jess took a moment to concentrate her mind. Then she screwed up her nerves and stepped off the path. There was a brief sensation of weightlessness, then a rushing feeling. When Jess opened her eyes again, she was standing on thin air. She looked down beside her. The path had gone. In its place was a long, narrow, horizontal ladder that seemed to move and squirm under her gaze. But there was something wrong here. Jess peered more closely at the ladder. The perspective was all wrong. Her brain lurched as she suddenly realized that it wasn't right in front of her, but in fact it was quite a distance away. It was like looking at one of those Escher paintings, which look perfectly fine so long as you keep your eye in one place, and then kick you in the brain as soon as you try to follow any of the lines. It was like getting an ice cream headache in your soul. Jess followed the ladder with her eyes, tracking along it until it reached the mountains ahead of her. There was something wrong here, too, a, a nagging sensation she couldn't quite put her finger on. Then she worked out what it was. The ladder was pointing downwards, not along. Jess's mind gave a second squill of complaint as the world spun around her. Her sense of balance informing her that she was now the wrong way up. Acting on some long-buried instinct, she closed her eyes again and counted to ten. When she opened them, she was facing the right way up. She looked down and found that she was now standing on the narrow, rocky ledge at the end of the ladder, set back into the mountainside. Above her, the dark mountain loomed. Now she was looking down at the ladder rather than across at it. Above her, the lights of the hilltop glowed, casting their ghostly light downwards. Jess looked down, then gasped, unable to believe what she was seeing. Close up, she couldn't see the ladder was made up of living human bodies. They twisted and writhed as she watched in horror, bound together by what looked like bloody cords, standing on each other's shoulders to make up the length of the ladder. Some of them were relatively normal-looking, but others were the stuff of nightmares, naked and disease-ridden, crawling with maggots. The stench was appalling. Some had missing limbs, others had huge holes where their internal organs should have been revealing gaping cavities, their bodies crushed and mangled. One guy, with only half a head, waved to Jess, his brain clearly visible inside his skull, which had been cracked neatly in half like two halves of an orange. He reached out to her as she backed away, pressing herself back against the rock. Then Jess felt a creeping sensation run up the back of her neck, a feeling so deeply buried and primal that it took her a moment to figure out what it was, then she knew what it meant. Somebody was watching her. Hardly daring to look, Jess inched along the edge of the rock until she was a mere couple of yards away from the top of the grisly human ladder. The ledge was so narrow that she couldn't get much further away and still see down, but for now it was enough. The people on the ladder didn't seem to be threatening her in any way, but she still wanted to keep her distance, if only because of that smell. Carefully, she crept to the edge of the rock and peered over the side. At first, she saw nothing, just an endless infinity of darkness, stretching down and down forever. Then, as her eyes adjusted to the gloom, she began to make out a dark, ominous shape, moving slowly towards her, up the human ladder. It was still at a great distance to her. Jess guessed that it must be pretty big to be visible from this far away. Gradually, she became aware of a strange sound, it was quiet at first, barely more than an oscillating whisper, but then gained in intensity as the dark shape crawled up the ladder towards her. It was kind of a rushing sound, like sand being poured onto a tin tray, 
getting louder and louder until it sounded like a thousand birds taking flight all at once, filling the air around her with the sound of their wing beats. The randomness of the noise began to slow, slow, slow down, until it sounded as if the wing beats were perfectly synchronizing with each other, as though the unseen birds were all impossibly flying to the same beat. Jess backed away as the sound slowed down still further, dropping in pitch until it seemed to pass into the subsonic range. Jess listened, her skin trying to crawl off her body and run away to hide, all by itself. She suddenly became aware of how alone she was out here on this ledge in the darkness. She peeped back over the edge again, and a bolt of fear shot through her. The thing, whatever it was, was closer now. She could already start to make out its shape. It was vaguely human in form, but there was something inherently wrong about it, as though she was seeing the memory of a human shape, rather than an actual physical presence. It seemed to be sim simulating human activity. It was simultaneously taking its time and moving astonishingly quickly, although Jess couldn't see how this could be. As it drew near, details became visible. Jess drew in her breath sharply. The only frame of reference she could come up with to describe the creature was skeletal. But this didn't even come close to describing it. Not even close. It didn't just have one set of bones. It had, Jess decided, all the bones that had ever existed. Every species, every shape, every twisted mutation. They were all there, picked out by the sickly glow from the mountain. The creature flickered and fluctuated as it moved, its bones stretching and evolving and forming new and wild shapes and connections, the ghostly bones appearing to be brand new and crumbling at the same time. It was like looking at the living embodiment of an infinitely long time-lapse photograph, every second made physical and represented by the bones of the creatures that lived at that moment, all at the same time. Peering closer, Jess saw that the creature was dressed in the blackened and charred skins from a thousand different animals and humans, forming a kind of robe that hung from its bones in oily tatters. Some of the skins appeared to be still alive, twitching and bunching up as the creature moved. Beneath the robe, the creature's arms and legs were splattered in blood from its victims, adding a splash of terrible color to the gleaming white bone. As the creature climbed up each living rung of the human ladder, the people, and Jess used that word loosely, it touched, cried out, and began to age at an astonishing rate their flesh withering and cracking until their bones looked almost shrink-wrapped. As the creature moved on, their bodies decayed at high speed and then burst into dust, showering the night air around them with floating particles. Jess started to back away as the creature drew close. The white noise sound it gave off became louder and more intense, filling her head with its buzzing like a swarm of angry radioactive wasps. She knew instinctively that the sound was somehow dangerous, and that she should try to shield herself from it. She tried putting her fingers in her ears, but that only seemed to concentrate the sound. A strange sensation made her look down at her hands. She saw that the skin on them was withering, aging, weeks, months, years, in a matter of seconds. That did it. Her nerve cracked, and she ran back across the ledge to the side of the mountain. She looked upwards, craning her neck back. The mountain was impossibly high, over a quarter of a mile of sheer rock separating her from the top. There were no handholds, no footholds, nothing. Jess sagged. She could never climb it in time. She felt herself weakening even as she contemplated the idea and looked again at her hands, feeling despair creep over her. The skin on them was wrinkled and calloused, as though she were in her late sixties instead of in her teens. Jess bit down hard on the inside of her lip in fear, and then reached up to her mouth with a grimace. Her teeth seemed to be loose for some reason. She touched one hesitantly with her tongue, and then gave a yelp as she felt it come loose from her gum. She put a finger into her mouth, pressing it back into place with a jolt of fear. In her ears, the radiation-style buzzing increased, becoming almost a physical presence. Really, really not good. Turning around, Jess was struck by a sudden idea. 
Holding her breath so as not to breathe in the smell, she dashed back to the top of the human ladder, moving as quickly as she dared, trying not to look down. She began stamping hard on the fingers of those who were holding the ladder in place, crushing the blood-smeared hands holding onto the edge of the rocky ledge. Cries of pain rang out, echoing through the buzzing silence of the void. Perhaps if she could knock the ladder down, she could stop the freaky skeleton creature from reaching her. She had no idea what the creature was, but in her experience, anything that dressed in human skins was usually bad news. Hey, cut it out! Jess looked up, bewildered to hear the familiar voice. She looked down at the faces of the first few people on the end of the ladder. They were naked and covered in blood, but after a second she gave a gasp of recognition. Charlie, Amber, the female cop from the station, and the bouncer. They were all there, just feet beneath her. The injuries that had killed them revealed in chilling detail. Charlie's body was crushed and mangled, his head listing at a strange angle. Amber was missing an arm, her torso bisected by an almost cartoon-like tire mark. Below her, the cop's skin was white and covered in deep, purplish bruising, a bullseye-shaped mark showing up starkly on her thigh. Jess didn't dare look at the bouncer. "'Hi, how are you doing?' asked Amber brightly. Jess stared at her. "'You're dead,' she said eventually. "'Uh-huh. Have you seen my arm?' "'No, I, uh...' Jess paused while her brain rearranged itself. "'I think they took it to the morgue along with the rest of you. "'There were several bags with you in it, I think.' Jess shrugged helplessly, unable to believe that she was having this conversation. "'I'm sorry.' "'Well, that sucks. None of my clothes will fit me anymore. "'I don't have to get them altered. Do you know how much that costs these days?' I haven't a clue. Jess glanced feverishly down the ladder, which was starting to shake with the approach of the huge creature. It was still quite a long distance away from her, but she didn't want to be here if it got any closer. Listen, she said urgently. Do you know a way out of here? Out? There ain't no out, rumbled the bouncer. Jess dared to look at him and instantly wished that she hadn't. The flesh of his face was hanging off in tatters, and one eye was missing, the socket filled with bruised flesh. He peered at her closely through his smashed sunglasses. Oi, I know you. Do you have your ID on you? Not at the moment, no, Jess said desperately. Do I need one? This is hell, right? No, just L.A. You want to get out of here? That would be nice, said Jess. As the sibilant hissing of the creature below filled her ears, she got ready to run. But you don't have an ID? Knock it off, bro, came a voice drifting up from further down the ladder. Jess inched forward and peeped down to see Tony looking up at her from ten feet further down. He gave her a little wave, blood trickling down his torso from his crushed skull. Hey, girl! Jess fought down a wave of nausea. Hey, she managed... Good to see you again. We all missed you. Oh, you want to see a trick? Look at this. Tony turned sideways and waved a hand through the rectangular hole in his torso. Ta-da! Great, huh? I'm thinking of adding it to our stage act. If I can just catch my breath. That's great, said Jess, covering her mouth with her hand. Sorry, said Tony, wiping the blood off his fingers. Had a lot of time to myself recently. It's kind of dull being dead, you know. There's no TV here for starters, and very little sex. You gotta get your entertainment where you can. I guessed as much, said Jess faintly. She looked down the ladder, beginning to recognize a few faces here and there. Wasn't that the barman from the club? And over there, the naked girl with the interesting eyebrows. Wasn't she Charlie's friend from the dance floor? Jess realized that everyone who had died in the club was a part of the ladder. Their bodies broken and battered but still very much living. And Charlie and the others were right at the top. What kind of freaky place was this? Something caught Jess's attention, and her brow creased with concentration as she tried to figure out what it was. She peeked cautiously back at the bouncer. He was the lowest down of the four. With the other three above him, Charlie was at the top. Jess suddenly realized how the ladder worked. People were placed on it according to the order they died in. The echo of a memory nagged at her. 
and Jess cast her mind back to her original premonition, trying to remember what she'd seen. She'd successfully blocked the images from her mind up until this point, but now it all came flooding back in full technicolor detail. The bouncer had died first, when the ceiling had fallen on him, then Amber and Charlie had gone down, felled by a girder. The police officer had died next, impaled on a flying drumstick. Jess realized with a jolt that this was the order they'd actually died in, in real life, which meant that, Macy, she'd be next to die, in her premonition, when a second girder had fallen on the bar. Didn't that mean that she was going to be the next one to die in the real world? Jess knew that she had to get out of this place right now and warn her. But hadn't it started already? The fire in her apartment, the exploding AC unit, it was as though the world was out to get Macy. She had to save her. But right now... Jess flinched as a cold, wet hand gripped her calf, breaking the spell. She tore her eyes away from the approaching creature to see Charlie trying to pull himself up onto the ledge, holding on to her leg. His smashed head listed drunkenly to one side as he swiveled his blue eyes in their sockets, attempting a grin. Yo, Jess, give me a hand here. I'll help you out. He waved the stump of his right arm at her, the hand of which was missing. A hand, get it? He chortled, blood trickling from his mouth. Dude, that was sick, said the bouncer in a monotone. Her skin writhing in horror, Jess yanked herself free from Charlie's icy grip, wiping the blood quickly from her leg. I'm fine, thanks, she said. Charlie reached out for her as she backed away. Aw, oh, come on, help me up. If you're gonna die, you might as well have a bit of fun before you go, Jess. He leered at her suggestively. You what? In reply, Charlie gestured down at his naked, blood-slicked body. Jess tried not to look. Charlie gave a sly grin. Come on, how about it? It'll be just you and me, baby, together till the end. Are you crazy? You're dead, and your girlfriend's watching. Jess stopped. Why am I even being logical about this? Get away from me, you freak. Charlie gave an exaggerated sigh. That's what Amber said. She doesn't want me no more. Can't think why. He tried to scratch his head with his bloody stump, looked surprised, then and gave a short, bitter laugh. Come on, sugar pie. I've seen the way you look at me. You can't take your eyes off me. I know you want me, te Jess. You always have. Jess's expression turned to one of deep revulsion. She started to back away, then looked sharply down at her hand. The blood she'd wiped off her leg was moving, squirming across her hand like a living thing. She shook her hand urgently, trying to get rid of it, and the blood became liquid again and poured off onto the ground. Jess cried out as it flowed towards her and attached herself to her foot, instantly solidifying and fixing itself to the rock like an organic shackle. Jess cried out again and she kicked frantically at it, Try as she might, she couldn't pull free. Charlie gave a horrible little laugh and began dragging himself towards her, his eyes fixed hungrily on Jess as she struggled to free herself. Then he paused as an angry screech came from below them. Oh, miss, I think you should run now, called the bouncer. Jess reflexively glanced over the edge of the precipice. The skeletal creature was nearly upon her covering the last few hundred yards in a blur of arms and legs, flying up the ladder at an impossible speed. The buzzing noise was almost unbearable now. Jess clapped her hands over her ears, grimacing in pain. The noise seemed to be draining her will to move, to breathe, to do anything other than to stand there and watch the creature approach. A screaming sense of dread filled her, but she couldn't move. Even if she could, there was nowhere to go. She watched helplessly as the creature flew towards her, the crumbling remains of human bodies falling aside all around it. Approaching the top of the ladder, the creature swung its head around, then suddenly snapped it up towards Jess, fixing her with a knife-like glare. Jess felt her blood turn to ice as its undead gaze pierced her like a thermal lance. Everything else around her faded away. The creature's face was terrifying, all jutting bones and dead flesh. It had no eyes, just two deep, dark holes in the center of its face. 
To Jess, it seemed as though its eyes were infinitely big, like galaxy-sized, black holes in outer space, sucking up everything in their path. She felt herself start to fall forwards, drawn by their deadly pull. Below her, she watched as Charlie was sucked bodily away from her, his expression turning to one of dismay. Within seconds, he and the others had turned to withered skeletons, crumbling away into the void. And then the creature was upon her, its black eyes boring into hers. There was only one thing left to do, summoning up every last ounce of her willpower. Jess clamped her eyes shut and wrenched herself away from the creature, just as it reached out for her. Concentrating, she opened her eyes again and broke into a run, her gaze fixed determinedly on the edge of the rocky ledge. She refused to stay here and die. If she was going to die, she wanted to do it on her terms. Her feet left the ledge, and then she was falling, plunging down through empty air, her body tumbling over and over as she plunged downwards into infinity. Behind her, the creature screamed in fury. Jess gasped as she woke up, sticky and sweating, and fought her way out from under the blankets on her bed. She subsided, panting. Beside her, Jabo mewed in greeting. Jess looked at him. Oh, Cat, you're not going to believe this. Jess reached a trembling hand towards her cell phone, which glowed dimly on her bedside table. Switching on her bedside light, she began dialing. So remind me while we're here again? I just told you, crazy girl called, said she needed to see us all. Ugh. Eric pulled at the white plastic collar around his neck. You should have just given her the number of my shrink. Why won't she leave us alone? It's the middle of the goddamn night for Pete's sake. Ben tittered. Like you'd be able to sleep in that thing. You look like a dog that's just been to the vet. He blew bubbles in his strawberry milkshake, attracting strange looks, then pulled out his straw and sucked the milkshake off it. Hey, don't scratch. I can't help it. It's driving me nuts, man. Eric let go of the collar and gingerly prodded at the bright blue bruising on the side of his head. The swelling started to go down a little, but it still hurt like hell. It throbbed under its touch. He dreaded to think what the hospital bill was going to cost him. Hey, loser. What? Jamie answered and then screwed up his face in annoyance. Shouldn't have answered that one so quickly. He picked the salt shaker off the table and shook it up moddily, glaring at Eric. The top fell off and salt spilled out onto the table. He swept it quickly onto the floor, grimacing. How much does it cost to go to this hospital? Dunno, never been. What, never? Nah, don't you have, uh, health insurance? I don't got it, I can't afford it. Dude, how do you live? Very, very carefully, said Jamie. He glanced at his watch. Where's she got to this time? He muttered to himself under his breath. I think you were very brave. Jamie glanced at Macy as she put a hand on Eric's arm, gazing up at him brightly. She completely ignored Jamie. If it had been me that fell down those stairs, I'd be in bed for at least a month. That's because you're g Eric began, then stopped as Ben kicked him hard under the table. He paused, then looked at Macy afresh. Um, because you're a great person. He glanced sideways at Ben for approval. Macy beamed. I'm sorry I'm late, guys. Hey, Jess. Hiya, Jess. Ben mimicked, then flinched as Jamie threw a handful of salt at him. Jess threw her jacket down onto the red plastic seat and plucked a menu from the middle of the table. She was wearing black jeans and a sweater, her hair scraped back into an efficient-looking ponytail. Do they have coffee here? About twelve different kinds, I think. Take your pick. Great. Order me the eleventh kind, whatever that is. Macy, come with me. Where to? Restroom, said Jess, marching towards the back of the diner. A waiter, laden with four heaped plates of burgers, swung to the side as she strode past him in the aisle, then deposited the burgers in front of the others. Why? Oh, Macy turned to Eric. Excuse me, I have to get up. She squeezed her way out of the booth past him, doing what Jamie thought was an unnecessary amount of wriggling to get past. She trotted off obediently after Jess. The three guys munched their burgers in silence. 
Above the table, a neon sign in the shape of a dancing girl with a gun buzzed, casting a flickering red and blue light over them as they ate. Why do they do that? Eric asked when the two girls had gone. Do what? Go to the bathroom in pairs. Who knows? They're girls. They do, they do what they want. Just stuff like that, said Ben, pulling a pickle out of his burger bun. There was no ashtray, so he tossed it onto the floor. Eric reached for the salt, found that it was empty, and gave Jamie a filthy look. Don't know about you, he said, but I always picture them dancing naked around their purses when they go to the restroom together like that. That takes two, one to hold the purse, the other to do the dancing. Nice image, said Ben, gazing out of the sloping plate glass window at the night. Outside, the bright lights of Hollywood glittered at him, cars streaming past on the packed boulevard. The revelers were certainly out in force tonight, he thought. He chewed thoughtfully for a moment. So, don't think they've just gone to have a talk in private? Talk? Nah, why would they want to talk? Eric skewered a load of fries with a fork and stuffed them into his mouth. There's a whole world of hot lesbo stuff they could be doing in there. Maybe they'll tell us about it when they come out. He stopped as he saw the other two staring at him. What, like you've never pictured it? And it doesn't, uh... You know, doesn't that band girl have a pierced tongue? There was a brief silence while they all contemplated this. After a minute, Jamie ordered some more water with extra ice. A short while later, Jess and Macy emerged from the bathroom and sat back down at the table. Jess was looking grave. Macy was as pale as a sheet. So, said Ben, his head filled with a variety of interesting images. He nudged Eric, who smirked back at him. Macy looked at Jess, who took a deep breath. I need to talk to you all, she said. Go ahead, said Jamie, clearing his throat sheepishly. Yeah, if you want to tell us anything, we're all ears, said Eric, leaning forwards in his seat. He took a big bite of his burger, munching it excitedly. Jess and Macy exchanged worried looks. I'm not quite sure how to say this, said Jess. Macy put an encouraging hand on her shoulder. Go on, said Eric eagerly. It's just that... Yes? Jess let out her breath. Well, the thing is, I think that we're all going to die, she said. Mm, die, yeah, said Eric, his eyes glassy. Then he blinked. Wait, what? All of us, I think we might be in trouble, said Jess. Tell them about your dream, prompted Macy. Dream? Eric threw the remains of his burger down. Ketchup spattered onto the front of his white t-shirt, and he swore. Is that all this is about, just another of your paranoid little fantasies? Fantasies, ha ha, said Ben. Shut up, dude. Eric turned back to Jess. So you dragged me all the way out here in the middle of the night just to tell me about some stupid dream? It was more than a dream, said Jess. It was important, life and death important. Eric gave a deep sigh, resigning himself to his fate. Go on, then. Get it over with. Just make it quick, because I've got some major R&R time to catch up on. He glanced down at his T-shirt and pulled a face. And some laundry? Okay, I know this sounds... Crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. We've been there. Got that fucking postcard back already, said Eric. He glanced at his watch. Hurry up. I've got about ten minutes left on my meter. Jess gave Eric a hurt look. As I said, I had a dream earlier on tonight. No, scratch that. It was a nightmare. She shivered. A bad one. Did you eat pizza before going to bed? Asked Ben. Because I find that when I... And, said Jess, ignoring him, in this dream I saw everyone who died in the club. They were all there, all of them. It was just awful. Charlie and Amber were there too, and so was the bouncer from the club and that chick cop who died. I mean, everyone. Were they naked? Asked Ben. Not one to be able to let go of a chain of thought. Some of them were. Uh-huh. Jess told them about her dream. At the end, Jamie said, Hold on. Slow down. You mean to tell us that you saw Charlie and the other three die in your vision? No. Jess picked at the menu fretfully. I saw all of you die. I even saw myself die. That's what I was trying to tell you. We all died in your vision? I'm afraid so, and now people are dying in real life, and they're dying in the exact same order that they died in my premonition. Then why didn't you warn us? 
That's what I'm trying to do now, warn you, I mean. Jess paused dramatically. I think my vision might be coming true in our real life. Well, that sucks, Eric paused, glancing out of the window. Hold on a moment. Gotta put more money in my meter. He fished around in his pocket and pulled out a handful of quarters. Ben, can you go feed the meter? So, he carried on as Ben disappeared out of the door, grumbling. In this vision of yours, how did I die? Do you really want to know? No, but tell me anyway. Jess looked Eric in the eye. You didn't want to know back at the club. Huh? Oh, right. You got me there. You said you couldn't wait for me to die or something like that, cheeky bitch. Yeah, said Jess. I stand by my word, she said, her voice hard. Me too, but tell me anyway. Okay, fine. You got cut in half, all right? You were trying to climb out of the club window, and it collapsed on you. Splat. Very messy. The end. There was a moment of silence, then Eric said, That couldn't have been me. I don't climb stuff. You climbed the fence downtown. And the tree, put in Ben, returning from the car park. And by the way, there was some old street guy sitting on your car. I chased him off. Great, thanks, said Eric absently. He turned back to Jess. Okay, so I do climb things from time to time. That doesn't mean anything. He turned to Jess, dropping his voice. Does it mean anything? I'm not sure. The others didn't die the same way they die in my vision, but they still died in the same order. So it's like their deaths were fated? Put in Macy helpfully. Uh-huh. But I messed up that fate. My vision. I think it... I think it wasn't supposed to happen. Seeing the future just isn't normal, right? Jess took a sip of her coffee, reflecting. I cheated death, but then death just came along and took the people I saved using a different method. Death for me zero. And I think the game's still in session, guys. You're honestly expecting us to believe that horse shit? Asked Eric with a sneer. Whoever heard of such a thing? Ben timidly raised his hand. I once read in the newspaper that... Did somebody ask you? Be quiet. Drink your milkshake. Eric sat back in his chair as Ben scowled at him. Okay, then fine, he said to Jess. If you're so smart, who's going to die next? Eric, said Jamie, shocked. No, I'm serious. You want us to believe you? Prove it. Go ahead and predict the future. Who is it? Eric asked. Is it him? He jerked a finger at Jamie. No, it's not. Pity. Then Eric stared at her, realizing what she just said. You mean you actually know? Um, said Jess desperately, exchanging looks with Macy. Go on, then. Just tell him. Yeah, tell us. Who is it? I... I don't know if I should. Because? Beside Jess, Macy reached for an abandoned bowl of fries and began picking at them anxiously. Because it's not a good idea right now. And one other thing. That guy we met the other night, the homeless one, he said that we should look out for signs. Signs? Saying what? Like, road signs? No, signs. Like... Things that seem to be warning us that something bad might be about to happen. You know, ominous stuff. What a load of crap. Hey, come on, dish the gossip. If Jerkoff over there is going to buy the farm, I want to be there to watch. With popcorn and a video camera. I can make a fortune on the internet. Eric sniggered. It's not him, I told you. I just wanted to warn you all to be careful. Stay away from sharp objects if you can. And if you see a lot of, I don't know, pictures of knives or whatever, then for God's sake, don't go anywhere near cutlery drawers or restaurants and so on. Jess glanced at Macy, looking deeply unhappy. That's probably all I should say at this point. You can't say that to us, said Eric, his voice rising. Some of the other diners turned around to stare at him. You can't drag us out here in the middle of the night, tell us that we're all going to die, and then what? Waltz off back home? I thought you didn't believe me. I don't, but I still want to see you humiliate yourself. Eric picked up the remains of his burger and shoved it into his mouth, chewing rapidly. Go on. Tell us who it is, so we can all have a good laugh at you. He settled back in his seat as a thought struck him. Is it her? He said, swallowing. Macy dropped her fork with a clatter. Jess turned and put a hand on her arm, glaring at Eric. "'It is! I knew it!' said Eric. "'Oh, this is going to be good. When she gets to ninety-eight and dies in her sleep, are you going to come banging on the door of my retirement suite?' 
blowing a trumpet and demanding an apology? Because if you do, send me a reminder a couple days in advance so I can call everyone I know over to point and laugh at you. You know what? I really hope that turns out to be the case, Jess said quietly. Beside her, Macy picked up her fork and continued chewing miserably on her cold fries. So, Eric sat forward, his eyes gleaming. How's she gonna die? Eric, that's enough. You don't know what you're saying, said Jamie. He put a protective arm around Macy, who casually shrugged it off. He looked at her quizzically, but she completely ignored him, watching Jess with worried brown eyes. Jamie frowned. I know exactly what I'm saying, said Eric, and I'm saying that she's full of shit. Come on, people, think about it. Are you going to believe her? She's sitting here saying we're all going to die horribly, and that there's nothing that we can do about it, and you're just swallowing it? Please! I didn't say that there was nothing we could do. That's the whole point of me asking you out here. I wanted to warn you. Yeah, right. You wanted to warn us. You know what I think? I think you don't want to warn us. I think you want to scare us so you can feel better about going back to your boring two-bit life and getting ostracized by your loser friends because you've made yourself into a walking freak show, spouting off about all this premonition shit. Right, Ben? Right? Said Ben uncertainly. Eric picked up the remains of his beer and downed it in one gulp. Why don't you just admit you miss being the star of the show? All that stuff that happened at the club, it was horrible and nasty, and we've all got to deal with that. But first, get over the idea that you're suddenly all high and mighty just because you think you saved our lives with some whacked-out hallucination. And now what? A couple more folks have died, and now you've suddenly all excited because you see a chance to be the center of attention again? Eric slammed his empty glass down on the table, making Macy jump. Well, you can think again, little lady, because we control our lives, not some whacked-out idea of yours about some preordained fate. Take your handbag and your little drummer boy and fuck off back where you came from. There was a short, ringing silence. Then Ben said, What does ostracized mean? Jamie turned and whispered something in Ben's ear, his eyes fixed on Eric. Ben said, Oh? Then pulled out a biro and wrote something on the back of his hand. He frowned, squinting down at his hand. I didn't know there were ostriches in L.A., he said. Beside him, Macy snorted, her full mouth full of fries. Then a look of surprise crossed her face. Her head jerked forward, and she put a hand on her throat. She tried to cough, found that she couldn't, and banged a hand frantically on the table. See, even Macy agrees with me. Eric shoved his empty plate away from him and reached for his jacket. She's got her head screwed on right. She'll probably still be bouncing around when the rest of us are all six feet under. And do you know why? Because she's a tough old cookie, aren't you, my girl? He slapped her hard on the back. Macy spat half a soggy french fry out onto the table and sucked in a deep breath, then began coughing hard. Subsiding, she turned and wheezed at Eric gratefully, unable to speak. That's the spirit, Eric smiled at her with affection. Nasty cough you got there, by the way. Come on, Ben, let's get going. He stood up with a flourish, pulling on his leather jacket and motioning to a nearby waiter for the check. Ben stood up, shrugged helplessly at Jess, and stepped out into the aisle. As he did so, he nudged the cheap plastic table, which jolted and set the glasses clattering. Jess's half-empty coffee cup tipped over, pouring a dark stream of coffee across the table and onto the floor. The waiter chose that moment to walk past the table and deposit their check in front of Jess, carefully balancing an enormous tray of apparatus and drinks on one arm as he did so. Jess looked at him with a certain amount of foreboding. Look out for the... She began, but it was already too late. The waiter successfully stepped over the pool of water, but then his foot landed instead on Ben's discarded pickle. He skidded and stumbled forwards, his tray of food going flying. Jess watched as the tray flew over their heads and crashed noisily into the wall above them, plummeting to the ground in a din of smashing glasses and clinging cutlery. A shower of sparks rained on their heads as the neon dancing girl sign above them short-circuited from the impact. Then the whole display flickered and went out. Beer dripped down the walls, pulling on the booth's table. There was a round of applause from the rest of the diner as the waiter pulled himself to his feet, apologizing profusely. He picked up his tray and began sheepishly scraping the remains of the plates and glasses off their table. People turned back to their food and began chatting again. 
One or two giggles pierced the general hustle and bustle. The manager came running out of the kitchen and began shouting at the hapless waiter. Chill, man, don't worry about it. It's okay, Jess said, picking a twisty french fry from her hair and examining it to stop her heart thumping. We were leaving anyway, she paused. Um, the check? Forget it, it's on the house. But his face said, please don't sue us. Cool, and don't sweat it, man. It's not as though anyone died. Jess stopped, gazing at the crackling neon sign. It was swaying slightly from side to side, getting lower with each swing. She looked down at Macy, who was standing right beneath it, struggling with the zip on her sweater. A spark fizzed out of a crack in the glass as Jess watched. The top of the sign detached itself from the wall and started to swing lazily downwards. Here we go again, Jess thought, as she cried out. Macy, look out! Huh? Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 11 of Final Destination Dead Reckoning. Wow, what can I say about this chapter? I'm just now getting my breath back, but uh, what a terrifying nightmare that she had. And I hope I made it a little terrifying for you guys listening, too, with the sound effects and everything of him climbing up the ladder, his roaring, his growling, and all that. Uh, I was creeping myself out here with some of the sound effects I was uh, going through to pick which ones I was going to use. Probably going to have some nightmares. This nightmare fuel for sure. Some of them were pretty hardcore that I didn't use because it would have just overpowered the narration. But yeah, I love the nightmare scene. Oh my god, what a dreamscape. And Death Incarnate as that creature, whatever it was. I mean, the description was all over the place, but Jesus Christ, right? Oh, that was freaky. Uh, as far as the diner scene goes, I thought that played out very well. I'm really enjoying it. I mean... It sucks that we're down to like the last 60 or 70, 80 pages, somewhere around there, and things are like really kicked into high gear. I'm curious to see how fast these dominoes are going to fall now, because it seems like things are about to go crazy. The shit's about to hit the fan. Um, Eric really ticked me off in this chapter. I feel really bad for Macy. I feel bad for you guys, because I stopped on a hell of a cliffhanger there. But, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to getting back to this one very soon. Hopefully tomorrow I'll put out another chapter or so. It looks like we only got about three, probably three uploads left of this book is all we have left. Um, if I can pull it off in two, I'll do it in two. But it's probably going to be three more uploads. I hope you guys are enjoying it so far. Please give me your feedback on tonight's chapter. I thought the nightmare was amazing. I'd love to hear what you guys thought of not only the writing of the nightmare, but the way I narrated it and the sound effects and music I used. And, uh, yeah, let me know what you think of the book so far in tonight's chapter, and I'll be back very soon with more of Final Destination Dead Reckoning. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying, thank you for listening, and I'll see you soon. There's a lover in the story, but the story's still the same. There's a lullaby for suffering and a paradox to blame. But it's written in the scriptures and it's not some idle claim. You want it darker. We kill the flame. Lining up the prisoners and the guards are taking aim. I struggled with some demons, they were middle class and tame. I didn't know I had permission to murder and to maim. You want it darker? He nay, nay, nay. I'm ready, my 
calor. Burning for the love that never came 